Hello, my name is Stephen. I'm a clinical charge nurse in CAMS, currently working in South London, but I am about to move to South Wales. I'm delighted to be presenting again at MHNR. My presentation is called How We Say What We Do and Why It Is Important. It examines mental health nursing identity through the words of mental health nurses, not only in terms of what is said, but how it is said. To my knowledge, it is the only piece of research into mental health nursing identity that takes this approach. It's part of the advancing practice stream of this year's conference, and it reflects and expands upon the findings of an autoethnography I presented at last year's conference in London. My goal is to present a data-driven but still creative analysis of mental health nursing identity. One that provokes reflection and debate on the many aspects of our role, not just those that are readily spoken about, but also those that are not. I will also suggest answers to the implied question, why is mental health nursing identity important? So my presentation starts with the Mental Health Nursing Future campaign, which was an online campaign active through 2018 that sought to celebrate the profession of mental health nursing. The campaign produced 83 memes, some of which you can see on the screen now, 73 of which were gathered from mental health nurses themselves. These nurses lived all across the country and spoke from all stages of their career, also from a cross-section of clinical and non-clinical areas. So to examine this account, I combined and anonymized these descriptions into one text for interpretation. To carry out the analysis, I used word finding software to identify and isolate categories of nouns and verbs and to create typologies of verb endings as well as prepositions. These categories were determined by following a framework that I developed specifically from previous research into mental health nursing identity. The text was then interpreted in a hermeneutic fashion, which simply means that I, as a mental health nurse, applied my subjective understanding of the field, my experiences, my knowledge to the text to arrive an understanding of its contents. A different mental health nurse with different experiences, a non-mental health nurse, a service user, any other individual could have engaged with this data and with their different experiences arrived at different or perhaps similar interpretations. So as just mentioned, there have been a number of papers and documents public, published on the subject of mental health nursing identity in the UK. One unambiguous finding that's consistent across all of these previous studies is that mental health nursing identity is messy. It's multifaceted and difficult to express satisfactorily in simple terms. To demonstrate this, I created a framework of six mutually dependent, co-constituting themes or aspects of this identity that I call the six P's of mental health nursing identity. The statements on screen are some of the findings and concerns of the previous research that inspired the creation of these categories and give them their meaning. Now, I must stress that these categories have significant overlap. I developed the six Ps as a framework to guide my analysis and structure my findings, not as a definitive account of mental health nursing identity. So let's turn to the findings now. By professional identity, I mean the occupational roles and spaces mental health nurses picture themselves alongside and within. To explore this, I found and isolated all the role markers, activity nouns, and service nouns used in the mental health nursing future. So what does this data suggest to me? The most obvious answer is that mental health nursing is not one thing. It's a diverse community of practice that no matter how different their role, members see no conflict with their primary identification as mental health nurses. If we observe the frequency of the phrases mental health nurses and mental health nursing, this echoes previous research in suggesting that mental health nurses associate more strongly with their own and primarily describe their practice as distinct from other types of nursing. Indeed, note the complete absence of medical roles and the word hospital. Moreover, references to specific mental health services outnumber references to the NHS in general. This suggests, contrary to popular portrayals of nursing, that mental health nurses see themselves as neither dependent upon nor constituted by hospitals or the medical profession. By personal identity, I mean both the feelings that we have about our role and also our therapeutic use of self. To establish this, I looked at nouns expressing personal traits, which is this slide, and feelings, which is the next slide. So what does the data suggest here? 
Actually, in contrast to findings of the previous slide, when discussing their traits, mental health nurses do appear to share a value base with nursing more broadly, even if they refer to themselves as a separate group. To my personal relief, however, the notion of skills is mentioned most frequently. Now, I think this is important because what distinguishes areas of outstanding and areas of poor practice is not the presence of the, of the language of values, but rather principled activity. Improving standards is difficult, which is why leadership is understood as a skill. And I feel that being compassionate, empathic, non-judgmental should be understood in that very same way. What appears here again in support of previous research is the therapeutic use of self. So see phrases like self-aware, agent of hope. The skills and traits mental health nurses see themselves as having are located within the personality of the nurse themselves and manifest themselves not in just what they do, but also what they tolerate, what they can accept, and what they do not do, for example, judge. So the personal aspect is also expressed in statements about how we feel about the fact that we're mental health nurses. And a clear finding here is that mental health nurses feel privileged to do what they do. This was a word that was used over and over again. And arguably it conveys a strong sense of duty towards a social good located outside of oneself. At the same time, however, there is evidence here that contradicts the idea that mental health nursing is a selfless duty. See the words rewarding, amazing, gratifying. Many of these words support the view that mental health nursing is fueled by a feedback loop of validation. That mental health nurses thrive on feeling positive about the work that they do and that this appears to be an important motivation for doing it. So aside from the one mention of an infinite sense of unconditional altruism, mental health nursing actually appears rather an unaltruistic pursuit and I believe it's stronger for that fact. Turning to practical identity, this simply refers to the actual doing of the job. And so here we turn from nouns to verbs. We all know verbs are doing words. In grammatical terms, they're called predicates. They predicate the action or activity of a sentence. And on the screen here is a breakdown of all of the verb forms used in mental health nursing future by tense, ending, and whether or not they are preceded by an auxiliary or helping verb, such as be, can, would, do, etc. Now I wish to focus on the verbs used with what's called present participle ending or ing ending, which expresses continuous activity. Now, often when the ing form is used, it actually donates the beginning of a verb phrase that functions like a noun, and this is called a gerund. The gerunds that appear in mental health nursing future are introduced by many different verbs, as you can see on the screen. And I believe such a huge range shows why we find it so unsatisfactory to describe what it is that we do as mental health nurses in simple terms. So for example, let's take the following descriptions from the text that outline an aspect of what we do. Caring for those who suffer mental distress, combating stigma and discrimination, advocating for service users, empowering people and fostering hope, providing direct support and enabling self-support. Can we really leave any of these out when describing what we do? What can be said, however, is that the processes here that are referred to, the language that's used, the meaning seems very non-technical. The language is very non-technical. They're skills, but they're not skills that require or mediate, are mediated by or involve specific tools, equipment, or to take place in a specific arena. So in a sense, mental health nurses evoke the meaning of the root word of technical, the older Greek word techni, which means craft or art, which prompts the question in our self-concept, do we actually portray mental health nursing as more of an art than a science? So moving on now to proximal, this, refers to other identities in this care system that mental health nurses consider themselves close to. And as with the previous research, the primary answer is unquestionably the patient or service user. And on the screen now is listed every noun, pronoun or pivot used to identify a service user. Now what's different in this sample from previous research and perhaps from other areas of nursing 
is that when referring to patients or service users, we do not use those terms. Mental health nurses refer to patients as people, and according to this sample, make more references to systemic recipients of care, so families and carers, than to individuals as patients. Now, I find this significant. By shunning both the language of healthcare and of capitalism when speaking of people, mental health nurses demonstrate, on the one hand, that we really do not believe that there is an us and them, but also on the other, that we do not offer a product or service for consumption. Now, my theory here is that the facts of mental distress undermine the application of, for example, rational choice theory to describe an unwell individual. So, for example, how could a suicidal individual be a consumer? Or how could a multi-stage early intervention in psychosis be considered a product? Now, that's not to say that people experiencing mental distress should instead be understood solely by the diagnostic categories for that distress. And actually, that's also what the mental health nurses in this sample believe. They use broader, non-medical, non-psychiatric terms to describe the experiences of the people they work with. This certainly appears to support the interpretation that mental health nurses sincerely do not believe in the us-them distinction. Indeed, the only diagnostic labels used, which are in bold here on the screen, were possessed by certain of the mental health nurses themselves. Philosophical identity. What I mean by that is the underlying ideologies, both scientific and therapeutic, that animate and inform our work. This isn't a comprehensive list, this is just some of the influences that I found in the sample. I could have also added psychoanalytic, some phenomenological ideas. Um, but there was one idea that came up so frequently that it actually needs a slide of its own, and that was recovery. Based on mental health nursing future, it seems that mental health nurses have subscribed consciously, unconsciously, en masse to the paradigm of recovery. This is understandable, but not unproblematic. The problems with the recovery paradigm were articulated forcefully by the service user group Recovery in the Bin at last year's conference. Some of their key points being that the meaning and function of the phrase recovery has shifted dramatically to become principally defined and measured by institutions and become closely associated with work and economic productivity. So as nurses, we need to ask ourselves, if recovery does not belong to the people undergoing it, is it actually recovery? Here you can see a table listing all of the prepositions and verbs used immediately before a noun indicating a service user. Those suggesting that we care with and for people rather than do things to them are in the majority. The thing to bear in mind here though, is that Mental Health Nursing Future as a campaign to celebrate the profession is not the forum in which critical perspectives would feature. At no point in the text is the Mental Health Act mentioned, is restraint or enforced treatment mentioned. They're not even hinted at. And I think this would lead to the charge, perhaps the fair charge, that our identity has blind spots, not featuring the practices we may find unethical or feel uneasy about. Lastly, political identity. Now that this is used in a macro sense to refer to the precariousness of what we do as a profession precisely because of our complicated identity, because of this enduring difference between the professional and personal aspects of the role. Now, references to policy or professional bodies are minimal in this text, and there is also a total absence of any direct references to outcomes, which could be seen as problematic in that we might appear unconcerned by our effectiveness. However, the quotes on the screen here, improved service quality, world-class treatments, these clearly imply better outcomes. So in my interpretation, the mental health nurses in this sample do not fear that their complex identity threatens the future of the profession or its effectiveness. In fact, quite the opposite. Now, moving towards the end of the presentation here, this was my contribution to Mental Health Nursing Future, which was written roughly four to six months before I qualified. Since qualifying, I've worked in male and female intensive care, neuropsychiatry, and two national CAMS units, including adolescent intensive care, which was three trusts and lots of different specialisms in two years, which was never my plan. This is one reason why I moved around initially. 
This is an email I received after being assaulted for the second time in my first four months as qualified nurse. Now I show this to highlight that alongside all of the positive things that we feel in a text the size of mental health nursing future, in a campaign of that size, there's a total absence of serious discussions of the particular difficulties of this job. And that absence is there in the wider discussion of our identity generally. Some examples of the challenges that come to mind, restrictive practice of all forms, being the object of assault, not witnessing attempted or completed suicide or self-harm. We seem to struggle to talk to each other about this when talking about our identity. And this is something that needs to change. And I think that changing it could bring benefits for recruitment, retention and development. I think we need a more well-rounded discourse that includes both the profoundly positive and the profoundly painful. And I think it's actually ethically and politically imperative to do both. This is why our identity is important. Other reasons is that if we're consistent with the values that we saw in the text and we truly prioritize each other and our service users, we need a strong sense of our identity for the very reason that it legitimates critique, both that of our frustrated and aspirational colleagues, but also service users who've had bad experiences. Without an identity to counter, it's harder to identify our shortfalls between what we think we stand for and what we actually represent. And without this awareness, we cannot make decisive steps forward or really consider ourselves genuinely honest. Emancipation for ourselves and service users is restricted when we don't know what our limits are. A coherent identity would, would help us determine what are our present limits and hopefully make their overcoming possible. Furthermore, a modern identity, because this is quite a new profession, would allow us to differentiate from past forms of mental health care, from the limited to the abusive, which should provide ethical confidence in what we're doing now, but also tug at our conscience to continue to move towards less restrictive practices in the future. So that's the end of my paper. Thank you for watching. I hope you found it interesting. I look forward to discussing it with Jane and Carrie-Anne on Monday the 21st, along with their work and hopefully some questions. Take care.